是。I I can just see the recorder coming. Sir Rafael, can I please do a sound check? Uh, huh? No, just asking, Professor Rafael. Oh, okay. Rafael, you're very soft, Rafael. Can I what? No. Professor Rafael, you're very soft. Hmm. Doctor, but you are muted. Okay, now. Yeah, now it's fine. Can I just check the presentation if it's going okay? Have you? Uh, echo. Who's? Frederick. Yes, sir. You can hear me, right? Yes, yes. Uh, others are requested, please put off your video cameras. Uh, we'll have bandwidth uh, problems always. Luis uh, Godin and... Uh, In the... Uh, uh, screen showing? Yes, yes. Yes, it's come um, on uh, screen. Uh, Dr. Bhatt? Yeah, yeah, I can see. And is it, uh, is it moving also? Can you just change the slide? <laughs> yep. Is it? No, it has not shifted. Not shifted? Uh, now? Yes. yes. We can see it. I don't see anything. There's an echo coming from someone's uh, speakers because the mic is on. Uh, I is think it mine? Someone with, with the phone number 781. Eight one, could you please put off your microphone? Uh, that's uh, Dr. Newman. Yeah, I'm here, but uh, I you... I'm just on a, on a phone, so I can't put off the microphone. Otherwise, I won't hear anything. It's just a, an iPhone. Okay. You know, the the uh, speaker sound is, is somehow getting picked up in some microphones. So mm. Have some difficulty. I, it's it's not a computer. It's just an iPhone. Okay. Yeah. Uh huh? Benji. Yeah. Difficulty is the the mic is shown 
uh, as if it is on, and that's why it is picking up uh, the sound. Uh, what shall I can do you, in that case? Can you use your controls on the phone to mute the mic? Just a sec. Yeah, take your time. Uh, could you just uh, read something and we'll check if there's still a feedback? Who, me, Professor? Yes. Test, test, test one, two, test. From text to print. Case study I, I of think work. that's fine. Professor Sikhad, it's over to you. Start now, right? You're fine. Professor Gupta is there. I can see him. Yeah, yes, I'm here. Yeah, I'm yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, good morning to all of you here. Uh, this is uh, Professor Bach from the Department of English at uh, Goa University. So as uh, the chairman of uh, Viva Board Hall for this uh, Viva Gusi examination of uh, Mr. Frederick Norona, who has worked on the topic titled From Text to Print, A Case Study of Goa, Understanding the Literary Production in 20th Century Goa. So I'm happy to say that uh, Professor Abhijit Gupta, the external examiner, uh, to introduce him to this August audience. He is, Professor Gupta is a professor of English at uh, Jadavpur University, Kolkata. His uh, areas of specialization are bibliography, crime fiction, science fiction and graphic novels. He research projects on varied areas like the history of Baptist Mission Press, the comic book in India, and, and science fiction and fandom. He has also authored the following books, New World Order, Transnational Themes in Book History, Print Areas, Book History in, in uh, India, Moable Type, A Book History in India, and uh, a few others. Professor Gupta, we are ha very happy that you are amidst us today. Thank you, and uh, I welcome you again. My pleasure. Thank you, thank you. Uh, now, I request uh, the candidate, uh, Mr. Norona, 
to to make his presentation uh mr norona you can take some 30 to 40 minutes okay yes and then uh once he completes the presentation then the then the external examiner would take over thank you you can proceed uh, mr norona good morning everyone chairperson of the board dr bud uh, professor gupta who's the external examiner my guide professor rafael uh, Fernandez, and everyone who's come here today and taking your time. I know you could have spent this time in different uh, activities, but I'm grateful for you who have come here. Uh, I would just uh, start my presentation. So the topic that I've chosen is from text to print, a case study of Goa, reproduction of 20th century Goa. If I could just get feedback and know that uh, the slides are changing, I'll be grateful. Yes. Is uh, Can you see the next slide, please? Yes, uh, the yes. slides are changing. Could I request Dr. Debashis Munshi to put off the camera, please? Uh, our bandwidth gets affected. Kindly put off the camera. So, uh, my uh, research guide is Dr. Andre Rafael Fernandez, as I said, and uh, uh, I've, I've chosen this subject for a special reason. Maybe I'll start with a small story which explains uh, my interest in the subject. So, slightly on a non academic uh, tone, I remember myself as a 12 year old boy going to the Mapsa market and uh, going to this bookshop there almost every week and asking them whether they had any kind of uh, new children's books coming. So this was uh, uh, in the 70s and they would tell me it's not yet come, you come next week and uh, probably you'll get it then. So then when I was in my late 20s, I got an opportunity to go on a scholarship to Germany uh, and uh, since it was a media scholarship, they took us to the Gutenberg Museum and I just picked up one of the small all us that introduces the museum and uh, to my surprise chronology of uh, what had happened in uh, different parts of the world relating to printing goa was mentioned very prominently there and it said the first printing press in asia six in goa so of course that they are talking about gutenberg style printing their own uh, technology before that but uh, in my mind, I couldn't really understand, uh, I couldn't connect, you know, cross the dissonance between the lack of books we grew up with and the fact that, uh, you know, this was the home to printing in Asia. So actually, I, uh, you know, it was it was a long term quest and to cut a long story short, I kind of uh, was trying to bridge these two different realities. And uh, because of my interest in the book and in my interest in publishing and the, the chance I got to do a, to do my uh, research at a very uh, kind of uh, late stage in life. Uh, no regrets for that. But, uh, you know, it kind of uh, allowed me to take on this subject and to find explanations to bridge this uh, gap between uh, these two different disparate realities. And that's where my topic comes about. So uh, the next slide show, gives you some hint of what this uh, what this uh, research is all about. Uh, this, uh, these are just uh, tables of, of the list of tables that we have in the thesis. And it talks about books, it talks about languages in Goa, it talks about uh, language politics, uh, the books that were published here and things like that. Uh, one of the most interesting uh, aspects of the slide was to try to piece together the story of the book in Goa, if I can use that term. And uh, it's, it's it's not complete, you know, I, I, I don't feel that I've done full justice to it. As I was half jokingly saying, even if I had another 10 years, I would have probably not completed it. But I finished uh, research on the last day at the last hour. And, uh, you know, it's such a vast subject, maybe a bit of more than I could chew. But I'm glad that I took it on because uh, it helped me to encounter all kinds of different places and people and, uh, you know, books and uh, realities and things like that. So this is a print. Printing press in Margao. Uh, it was a printing press in Margao, 
and it is uh, this the only thing that's existing is the is a is a, is the nameplate and the signboard which is kept in the house nowadays in the house of of the costas and uh, this is 2013 or 2014 so it's not like uh, ancient history it's, it's still there you if you go there you probably still see it uh, in today's talk we are looking at uh, three or four sections one is the structures and implications and approach of the thesis the findings looking ahead and the contributions and learnings from a personal issue also from a personal point of view uh there are actually uh, five chapters in the thesis together with the conclusion the first one is the introduction uh actually i've uh, made use of the introduction to understand goan history myself because it's such a complex issue and uh, you know we are just understanding parts of it like the elephant of hindustan the story of the elephant where different people see different uh, aspects of the reality and uh, based on that they are kind of uh, you know uh, understanding reality so for me it was a fascinating search because of my long term interest in understanding goa and it tied in very well and i'm grateful to the goa university for giving me this opportunity to work on a subject which i've actually been connected with and uh, as i went to the you know through through this work and try to build up a history of goa uh, a lot of learn many things uh, stood out very strongly i know i'm not a historian i don't have qualifications in that field and historians tend to be very kind of uh, possessive about their field they don't like not qualified people like us entering it but uh, you know the 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 fact is that goa was a colony of a colony in a sense uh, while goa was a colony of portugal portugal was ruled by spain for some period Uh, it was also blockaded by the dutch it was a uh, uh, kind of almost taken over by the french uh, at which stage the uh, the the portuguese uh, throne went to brazil and we settled there for a while which also affected printing in in goa and things like that in in portugal of course also and then uh, it was uh, you know uh, influenced by the brits the british who kind of uh, stationed their troops in goa somewhere around the end of the 18th century to protect protect the place from a possible invasion by tipu sultan and the french and things like that so so you know it's a very very kind of hot, uh, very kind very uh, complex kind of place and we need to see the history in perspective in that sense and all these developments my argument is all these developments in one way or the other develop the fate influence the fate and the fortune of the book in goa uh the other point is that goa was linked to uh, international uh, you know knowledge pathways in in that sense and uh, one of the interesting facts i found is that at that period of time uh, rome and to a lesser extent lisbon were the centers through which uh, a lot of knowledge passed and goa was actually although it's a tiny place it was and is a tiny place it played this crucial role of being a connector between uh, knowledge flows between uh, asia and uh, europe I'm not romanticizing it. I'm not saying these flows were equal or fair or just or whatever, but it happened, and it did influence both sides. Uh, Indian languages were influenced in a big way, and there's a full list of languages which were influenced. It's not just Konkani, Marathi, or or Malayalam or Tamil that you know that has been done in studying these languages. For them, you know, uh, is is quite 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 uh, vast and significant. and uh, you know very often it's dismissively said that the press in goa was a missionary press with a single aim of proselytizing and things like that which 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 is is true but you know my argument is that the side effects of this press were 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 different and uh, quite impactful so for example uh, if i'm a commercial publisher and i bring out books primarily with the money motive in mind that doesn't reduce the relevance of my work to society in the sense that uh, it would it would me i i could also do some good work although i'm you know obsessed with money in that sense okay so so then the next chapter looks at its title the power and the periphery and it looks at uh, publishing printing lithography libraries uh in in goa in particular 
and uh, you know questions of who controls the press and the uh, diverse models that were used to publish the text in uh, in, uh, in 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 colonial goa and in post colonial goa also uh, i just should have mentioned earlier that while my my thesis tries to give uh, tries to create a overview of printing in goa from uh, this mid 16th century it particularly looks at the 20th century so so you know uh, that's that's the focus of the second chapter when it comes to lit lithography i found it interesting because uh, it kind of uh, you know it underlines the the link that goa had to printing in all odd and unnoticed kind of ways so one of the first and most prominent lithographers was uh, someone called zay maria uh, from zay maria gonzalez from divar uh, and divar island and he was you know serving the british and went to afghanistan and did some early lithographs there in terms of libraries also goa has played quite an early role and i'm grateful here to to uh, to the uh, to the work for libraries of uh, pia minezes and for the work on lithography of uh, murari Rang uh, ranganathan who has been writing a series of articles in uh, in, in print india explaining the different facets of uh, printing in india as a whole including some related to goa which which have been cited in the thesis the third chapter is on economics and efficacy and the author's position in a small society so that's the point that i keep on coming back to that the size of the society depends on how far the author can grow uh, you know what kind of print runs he can have and he or she can have and things like that and the role of libraries in in goa you know, which i just mentioned uh, the fourth chapter is called beyond the home and it looks at uh, diasporic writing uh, writing in exile and where goans were published there's a very interesting uh, kind of uh, table on the different places that where the different places in which goans got published now it's not very easy to uh, to list all these and it's a kind of random method you know it's it's quite possible that i missed a whole lot of uh, places where they actually got published so like you know it's just about finding the right books and mentioning examples of case studies and also it's not only in india but in different parts of the world where they are they are actually getting published you know so in india they are all over the place like the big cities of course you would expect bombay calcutta and chennai madras and you know places like that but even they've got published in soundwadi they've got published in jabalpur they've got published in uh, belgaum and you know places like uh, outside india all over outside india you would expect places like lisbon and london to feature on this list but what about say thailand and and uh, kuala lumpur and you know uh, the reason is that goans are a very kind of migration oriented society and uh, you know they 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 would get published in any place where they could find themselves being published so some have got published in brazil this is like you know 100 200 years back so because of the absence of local opportunities they kind of uh, got published far and wide and here i kind of borrow from the work of dr robert newman who is also here in the audience today who argues that uh, the goan community world worldwide is probably per capita one of the most diasporic prone at a global level so he is comparing it to places like uh, you know uh, cyprus and malta and lebanon and he says that you know the scale of bone migration per capita of course is uh, is that large among the largest in the world so uh, my argument is that uh, bone writing in english at least is largely diasporic defined has been has been uh, now it is changing now you find a lot of local production but it has largely been diasporic defined and we learned that from the anthology of uh, the uh, professor peter nazareth which came out very early somewhere in 83 or 84 and uh, you know was an eye opener to people like us who 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 realized that there's so much going on out there and earlier we didn't even know that this writing existed and the last chapter is called politics prose and power and looks at language shifts and you know the other non literary trends that have shaped writing in goa so it looks at uh, you know specifically at uh, the roles of portuguese konkani marathi english 
and uh, you know how how language languages compare among each each other and how many books are getting published and those kind of things so it's quite surprising that even a small place like goa till today uh, produces about 100 books in each of the three major languages that uh, every year three major languages that that kind of uh, uh, are prominent here that is konkani marathi and english and uh, it tries to solve the language puzzle and you know explain why why konkani is not the most read language in goa today for instance you know uh, so yeah it takes up these issues that's the fifth chapter and uh, the politics of the books of the book is also discussed here and uh, finally uh, there's a conclusion at the end of it okay so as far as the thesis goes uh, it's focused on 20th century goa there's a timeline which explains the growth of the book and the landmarks of that growth at different points of time there's a comparison between the histories of goa portugal india and the book so it's like you know in four different columns uh, is juxtaposed against the other because we try to sometimes i feel we try to look at history as if it's isolated from from external influences okay so uh, we we see religious intolerance and we from um, say the reformation in europe in that sense and uh, we 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 are losing a kind of perspective by not linking up these uh, events and uh, seeing in my case i'm looking at how these events are shaping the for better or for worse also uh, the literary developments in goa is set against wider realities and uh, we try to attempt to create a framework to explain the changing fortunes of the book here you know what i was talking about at the start from having no books in the 70s to being the center of book production knowledge production 3 3 400 years earlier and then the goa's dias goa goan diaspora's contribution is focused on and the global links and influences are noticed where relevant as far as the justification for the research goes i kind of uh, you know argued that goan uh, goa has a crucial understudied role in india's book history so you know it's not uh, widely understood uh, outside goa partly because of lang- reasons of language and you know goa's uh, colonial history is so different from the rest of india so you know people tune off before they even get started and then it is uh, often understood in cliches in that sense uh, you know whereas the the field is is much more complex and vibrant and uh, forget about it being not understood elsewhere you aside that it's it's not understood at home itself you know so people would not uh, know facts which one would have thought that you know would have been widely spoken about or discussed that you know the relevance of goa to printing and things like that uh, also the work continues uh, the earlier uh, you know kind of uh, contribution of people like alessio costa who was this uh, curator or head librarian of the central library and he's he's done these four volumes three and one more somewhere there uh, which is called the dicionario the literatura goesa Uh, one is published in Goa, the last one, and the first three are published in Macau. Very difficult to come by. I'm sure most people may not be aware of these because it's just not available. So you're in a situation where information is in short supply, and the books also are in short supply. So if you don't know, how do you get to know? So you know, I think it's important to continue this work, to promote this work, to to, to spread the word that uh, you know these texts are there. Uh, so you know that's elisho costa sholberg henry sholberg the late henry sholberg who has done his bibliography of goa together with uh, mrs dr archana kakotkar who passed away very sadly just last month and uh, of course dr karmo azavedo that's a well known work and uh, also a former goa university librarian uh, vr navelkar who has a uh, kind of uh, you know put together all these bibliographies of the of the collections of uh, Carmo Azevedo uh, uh, Dr Pisulerkar and uh, Nuno Gonçalves which is very interesting if you read in between the lines you know i i kind of uh, i found so much useful material in their quoting letters and quoting discussions and which authors are accusing whom of plagiarizing whom and 
which book is a reply to whom and all these kind of things you know so so it's interesting uh as far as the methodology goes uh, this is a descriptive study uh it's used observation and interviews primarily uh, the sample is based on resources available by that i mean you know it's quite possible that you tell me you missed out something very important in that sense and and, and that is possible you know i i'm not uh, defending myself uh because it's such a hit and miss kind of field so you know the books need to be available you need to find them they should be within reach of course the net makes it easier no doubt but uh, there is still a lot of uh, lot of uh, work to be done here and uh, like you know henry scholberg whom i just mentioned put it very well in his book he said that uh, he was doing this bibliography of the portuguese in india and he was listing all the books dealing with that particular period and he said that if i uh, if i know that a book exists but i have not seen it i'm not going to list it because uh, you know why should we why should we uh, why should we give additional life to a ghost something like that he said like you know so so he searched all the libraries of people in different parts of goa in different parts of india and different parts of the world and you'll be surprised that you know uh, some of the best resources are outside of goa so we are always critical of the portuguese of saying that they destroyed our literature and all but actually in a sense part of it that is preserved is still there and waiting to be recovered and understood and and so uh, it reminds me of uh, you know what happened just the other day so i was uh, boasting to some librarian friends that this is a work i've done and look at it and you know can you tell me sir it's tough to get a listing of the marathi novels written in uh, in goa and he said uh, you know no before before that uh, i told him so i depended on my friend uh, professor ramdas kelkar and he kind of submitted uh, to me he he gave me some of a listing which i am not very sure of you know how how detailed it is because these books are very hard to find and i i just put it in a in a in one of the appendix in one of the appendices so within 2 minutes the librarian mr mamal came out and said you know i've got this book i've published it and it's a listing of uh books published in marathi from the start till 2012 it's it's just a bibliographical listing but very interesting nonetheless so you know sometimes we are not aware of these resources and and there is a uh, in this field ignorance is bliss <laughs> you know I, i mean i'm sure some holes will be pointed to in this thesis but to some extent it it fills the gap and uh, i've tried to retain diversity of geography of languages of gender migration and the different centers and i've tried to uh, get inputs from writers those into printing and publishing uh my findings basically are that uh, you know there are a whole list of findings but i have to just select few or four major ones for this presentation talk out talk out were uh, you know goas was a colonial press nonetheless you know it still played the role of being a hub for global knowledge exchange uh the second one is that the swings in the fate of the book across the centuries can be explained through the co periphery theory i'll talk a little bit about more this about this more later uh it's it's not one of the latest theories it's like you know 1970s 1980s i know i've not taken a uh, taken a very recent theory but when i read it i immediately felt that you know this is something that uh help me to understand this field so well so the co periphery thing is basically saying that uh, there is a co and there is a periphery and the 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 co uh, is is the dominant parts and the dominant you know maybe the center of the of the center of the colonial spread and you know the periphery is on the outside so goa's role i would argue was earlier very close to the co but then it went into the periphery and uh, that that is why from being a center of book publishing and uh, printing it uh, you know ended up with a very little role to play uh the third point is that much of goa's literary production till very recently was uh, created mainly outside goa so that's i think the films or periodicals or whatever you know in books music lexicons 
some of them were published in Bombay, in Pune, in Karachi. There was this magazine called Door Maniachi Roti, which was published in Karachi, part of Undivided India and Goan migration in those days. Uh, the fourth point is there was a lack of option which read potential authors from Goa to get published in you know many different places which we just mentioned recently. Uh, another interesting finding is that uh, because of the high level of multilingualism, Goans, particularly in the diaspora, have written in about uh, 18, maybe 20 languages. And uh, you have to keep in mind that Konkani is written in five different scripts. So this is an idea which I got from Professor Peter Nazareth, who, when he compiled a list in uh, in the pre-internet days of the 80s, he said that uh, the figure was more like 13, but you can find you know there's much more, and probably this list is not complete itself. Uh, understanding migration, so you know because we wanted to to link up migration with the book, we kind of uh, use some statistics. There are no statistics which tell us how many goans are settled where because you know statistics are not kept on a regional level. But uh, these are guesstimates by the statistician John Nazareth, who explains the different kind of uh, migration levels in different parts of the world at different points of time. And uh, yeah, so some more findings like you know as I was mentioning, the texts are untraceable and lost out over time. And uh, you know, uh, as Raymond Williams says, we need to remind ourselves that books were not meant for the common man till very recently. So again, this argument uh, that you know we lack books and all has to be seen in context. So probably till a hundred years back, books were not a, an item of consumption for the common man or common woman, for that matter. Uh, I also look at uh, elite control uh, within the publishing process. You know, so it's obvious that uh, those who have access to technology are going to be able to use it more effectively. Uh, with every political shift, there is also a shift to a new set of elites in that sense, which is the point I make. And of course, Goa has had this point of uh, few or no publishers for much of its history. Even now, the situation is not too different in that sense. Uh, this is the Imprensa Nacional, the old Imprensa Nacional, now the government printing press in a part of Panjim, as it is still seen. And uh, that's a clock from there. Uh, you'll be surprised. Please pay a visit if possible. <laughs> this is non-academic. Uh, it's almost as if time has stood still there. So you'll find weighing scales which are like from 1960 or something like that, which look, they are kept as, brand, as good as new. Like, you know, it looks as if it was just taken out of the box yesterday. So some figures from the study, uh, 18 to 20 languages in which Goans have written, which is what I mentioned. The 20 is because, uh, you know, languages like uh, Russian and Burmese, I don't have any documentation for. So we know that DD Kos uh, uh, we know that Dharmanand Kosambi worked <coughs> in Russia and things like that. So, you know, I'm presuming that maybe someone has written in that language also. Burma, there was a huge Burm, uh, Goan community in Burma, uh, huge in the sense, significant for a small population like Goa. And uh, yeah, some of them speak the language and all, but I've not seen any experience of anyone having written it. The most unusual language was Latin, which uh, I first discovered was written by a fifth standard student in a school souvenir brought out by uh, St. Joseph Sarpora, one of the early English schools. And uh, the the souvenir was republished in during its anniversary about five or ten years back, which is why I saw it. Otherwise, I would have never known it existed. But uh, later on, I realized that even people like Abhi Faria and his father and all had done their thesis in Latin, so it's written. Uh, here to the right, we see that uh, you know eleven thousand is a number of publications cited by uh, Alessio Costa in his, in his book, in his uh, in his set of four books. So these are publications, some books, some some articles, you know, some reviews uh, written by uh, Goans, people of Goan origin, and uh, you know, in different parts of the world. And he covers something like two thousand authors. Uh, okay, uh, one two one one. 
1211. That's the number of books authored by Gurunath Naik, who is a Marathi author of uh, this uh, style of writing called the Rahasya Katha, which I think could be translated. Someone in Marathi could correct me. Could be translated to an action novel or thriller novel, or you know, the kind of pot boilers. Uh, in in my thesis, I've not bothered with the literary so-called literary merit of the work. I I've just gone by you know by the fact that it was published. So there's a single author who has 1,211 books, who's hardly known in Goa, and uh, most people would would not even uh, recognize the name. So it's just a few bookshops and places like that who who have you know who who would tell you that yeah, Guru Nanak Naik has written a book. And the other day, I actually bought one of it at a second-hand book sale for 60 rupees. So, you know, I'm looking at other small authors like uh, Reginald Fernandez, who was this very popular romance writer, and uh, also Damasian Karidad Fernandez, who each, each of whom might have written between 100 and 300 novels. So, uh, Damasian Karidad used to write a novel every Wednesday, just like imagine churning out a book every Wednesday. These were popular, small. Uh, pot boilers, no doubt, but it had a market, it was sustainable, it was viable. I'm not uh, making any literary judgment on these. I'm not sticking my work, restricting my work to the literary canon, the accepted literary canon. I think that, you know, all these things also, all these forms of writing have to be taken into account. So currently it's possible to see Goa as either lacking in publishing potential or having more books per thousand population than any other part of South Asia. So, like, you know, both of these two seem contrary, but it's possible that both can coexist because it's like the half empty, half full uh, glass of water, you know, syndrome. Depends how you look at it. Goa also has only a limited amount of organized book publishing happening, and yet this does not seem to hamper new titles from making it into print. Uh, then we go to the significance of the study, and, uh, you know, it helped me to realize that there is need. Because of the limited size of the market, we need other options to work on it, whether it's volunteerism, you know, support from the state, subsidies, which of course come with their own problems, but, uh, you know, it needs to be looked at. Uh, markets, you know, creating and uh, widening the market is a crucial issue. Uh, we lack readers also, and distribution is totally non-existent in Goa today. We'll come back to this later. Uh, Collaboration holds the key. We need alliances between not just uh, publishers and authors, but between language experts, educators, universities, and things like that. So uh, basically, yeah, this uh, looks at, uh, you know, as I mentioned, it looks at the observation and interview process, and the sample is based on available resources. I think we've already covered this. Uh, can the findings be generalized? Uh, I think it helps us to get an understanding of the pressures in the process of literature creation. And this is applicable to almost any process, especially the regions which are small and beyond the dominant discourse. You know, so if, if you're in a big city, probably what I'm saying here doesn't make much sense. But uh, today, while Indian publishing is booming, uh, much of the country is actually a desert when it comes to publishing its own local books. and. Uh, these are large parts, you know, apart from the big cities and, you know, if, if you go on a, on a holiday to maybe Kur or, or to some other place like Mysore or Samantwadi, you will not find uh, the relevant information that you need to navigate the place. Yes, in the local languages it is there, but, you know, at the wider level it's not there. Uh, it also helps us to understand the peculiarities, uh, the peculiarities of, uh, you know, such regions and the importance of understanding them. So then I kind of uh, talk about the strengths and weaknesses of the book in Goa today from what I found. Of course, the these percentages are just to go with the diagram. Don't take it as 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 uh, something statistical. You know, the recognition of the importance of the book and the written word is half and half. You know, there is some recognition, but not sufficient. Diversity of voices is uh, on the level of diversity of voices. Goa seems to be doing fairly well. Uh, on the question of sustainability of book production, you know, again, it's uh, somewhat there. But the weakest link, in my view, is that, you know, distribution networks, awareness of the book are lacking. So we have this typical Goa book syndrome. When a book is published, no one is aware of it, no one is interested in it. 
and when it's out of print, you'll find you know dozens of people asking you and begging with you for a copy. So from here, where uh, will the work be disseminated? Uh, yes, of course, it will be on Chod Ganga and things like that. So whether it, whether one should come out with a book uh, on it or not, I'm not so sure because. Maybe, maybe I'll do it. But you know, at one stage, I was thinking that uh, it would lend itself to being almost a graphic novel kind of work because these kind of discussions need to reach the wider, wider populace. And uh, you know, beyond that, of course, we need to reorient publishing in Goa, and we need to encourage more people to work on this subject in terms of taking the work ahead because there's so much to be done, and you know, it's never possible to finish it. In terms of the contribution of the thesis, I think it helps to build up an understanding of the book in Goa. Uh, I would also say that I've used the book as an excuse to understand the wider reality of Goa. And uh, in the thesis, you'll find uh, you know a lot of interesting facts and figures, which uh, don't quite strike you when you when you first when you first see it. You know, for example, all the early books published. Uh, published out of Goa in different kinds of languages. You know, the fact that uh, every power shift that happened in Goa kind of reflects in the publishing process, reflects in the names of the libraries, for example. So so you have the central library, which was one library which had six different names, each time reflecting a change in the, in the political reality of Goa. And this is not only between pre-61 and post-61, but within Portuguese rule itself, it started out as uh, publica libra libraria then it becomes uh, you know in 1936 in 1836 it becomes biblioteca publica then it becomes biblioteca nacional the nova goa and in uh, 1925 it becomes biblioteca nacional vasco de gama you know so so the names keep shifting then it becomes central library and finally it's now krishnadas shama goa state central library so you know all these realities are there you can uh, through the book, you can understand the wider reality of Goa. What it, what this thesis also does is to try to understand the book from 1556 onwards. Uh, you know, so there is a timeline. There are a lot of pointers. So I've used every excuse to mention whichever book I could lay my hands on and I thought was relevant to the debate. And uh, you know, it's been a passion of mine to collect books on Goa for the last 20, uh, sorry, for the last 30 to 35 years. And uh, you know, it's been a good opportunity to to try to see the links between all these and publishing. It helps to correlate the world and it helps to uh, look at the book for across languages in a, in a land which is very multilingual. Goa is extremely multilingual, but it's rec not recognized as such most of the time. Uh, also, it applies the co-periphery theory to, to the book. You know, Normally, co-periphery theory has been used to many other uh, aspects of life, whether it is labor economics, whether it is sociology, whether it is, uh, you know, imperial history and things like that. But uh, I found it useful to, you know, understand the book in Goa too. It links the local with the global, uh, both in terms of the books and the forces which shape the books in Goa. It uses the book as an excuse to understand Goa more deeply, as I said. There are lots of tidbits and uh, factors of, you know, facts of history, which if, if it comes up in the questions, I'll point to. And it looks at writers beyond the accepted canon, you know, people who have been doing work. So uh, Dale Lewis Menezes recently pointed out that, uh, you know, people like uh, Reginald Fernandez have never got an academic paper written on them as yet, uh, you know, and it needs company language skills, it needs literary analysis and things like that. So, you know, I think we need to open our eyes to these people, even though we may look down on their work and we may feel that, you know, it's it's uh, cheap pot boilers. I, I, I wouldn't kind of, you know, uh, dismiss it so easily. They, these were these were marketed works. They were thriving, successful, commercially viable works. And we guys still struggle to, to put that out when these fellows actually found the formula for doing it. Hats off to them. You know, it connects the literary with the economic history sorry, with the economic, historical, and the political factors. And uh, just a few more slides. Uh, so this is a kind of table which shows you the changes that Goa has gone through in different phases of printing. 1556, then the period where printing was completely blacked out due to reasons in, in Europe, not here. 
and then uh, the restart of the press, the launch of the first bookshop and publishing house called Casa Luso Francesca, Francesa, which means uh, Portuguese French home of books. And it was supported by Bertrand, which is one of the large publishers uh, in Portugal. And incidentally, they still have their uh, bookshop, which is the oldest bookshop, which is the oldest running bookshop in the world, like 300 years old, things like that. So, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting how these things connect. And then, uh, uh, you know, the history in India where after independence, till the 70s, 80s, India is struggling to produce its own book. And, you know, uh, so, you know, I think uh, where where India was in the 70s, we are still today in that sense. And, uh, yeah, early 21st century is where things change, change differently. And, you know, uh, it's all described in the thesis. So uh, there is a section on the language, politics, and the book in Goa over the centuries. And uh, it looks how Goa changed its role from being part of the Po, the center, the center that matters, to being a di distant periphery, you know, far away from the center, which uh, doesn't matter particularly. And uh, the Portuguese language, which was at the Po here, up to 1961, becomes the periphery. And uh, local and regional languages like Marathi, Konkani, and English grew in stature after 61. Uh, regions within Goa also witness shifting roles as poor periphery. So it's not like, you know, Goa is just one state where printing is happening throughout and in a very, you know, kind of egalitarian manner. Like there are pockets and there are there are power plays happening between these pockets. And, you know, uh, it's also visible to see the changing nature and the identity of poor periphery based on language groups, caste, community, geography, etc. And then uh, the last section is on the learnings. So, you know, uh, the the illustration is really <laughs> inept here. It should have been like, you know, because I feel that our knowledge is uh, learned is based on, uh, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants. And uh, I'd really, you know, like to pay tribute to some people who shape my understanding, you know, starting with P. Lal, who ran the writer's workshop in Calcutta. The workshop is still running, the, the, the center is still running, but uh, he passed away. And he had visited our university as a visiting lecturer in the 80s when we were students there. And uh, today when you talk about Pilar, there is a there is a very kind of a split opinion about his work. So some people see it, see it as vanity publishing and all, but this is a man who created 3000 plus books, my figures old. And, uh, you know, he kind of gave a voice to a lot of Indo-Anglian writers, as we used to call them in those days, including including many from Goa, through his own innovative kind of models and things like that. So I think somewhere in the back of our mind, when we heard him, we were impressed and we thought that if he could do 3,000, maybe we could do a few. <laughs> so, you know, I think his work has also influenced us. Professor Philip Alkbach uh, has been researching India since the 70s. And, uh, you know, many of the points I made about India facing a problem to voice its own issues through its own books in the 70s were made by him first and very articulatedly. When I searched, I was surprised to find that he was still active, though he shifted his fields, I think, to education. And, uh, you know, his insights were very useful. John Adler is a person who I just saw one interview of, and it was so interesting because he makes this point that you know, the New England Journal of Medicine, which is published from Boston, uh, a study showed that about 40% of the papers published there were from within a radius of 140, 150 kilometers from the center of publishing, which means that, you know, where you are also matters. It's probably more important than what, what you write at some level. So it ties in very well with my argument that, uh, you know, publishing is, is, is a game of chance. And it depends on a whole lot of non-literary factors. I'm sure that the writers here would feel upset, but it depends on a whole lot of non-literary factors uh, rather than you know literary factors themselves. And uh, of course, Professor Abhijit Gupta, who is uh, you know I'm really privileged to have him as our external examiner today. And uh, I, 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 you know, I took this risk of taking in of uh, you know kind of uh, hoping that someone so good could be our guide and I was over, you know, it's really a pleasure to have him because 
you know, as as a recent interview in Print India said, he's one of the foremost uh, history of the print scholars in the country today. And I first met him at uh, the University of Pune, where they had this uh, seminar on, on the history of the book in I think 2014. And uh, Jadapur University is one of the few universities in India, together with Pune, to a certain extent, who works on the history of the book. You know, Rochelle Pinto is, is is another person whose work is very, you know, has been very well received on on Goan history, uh, on, on Goan diasporic writing, particularly in a Mumbai context. Sandra Atai Lobo is, uh, you know, her, her work is also very well received by people who know Portuguese only, unfortunately, till now. And I met her very briefly at the Central Library. And I realized, you know, that we had parallel interest and you know, uh, so her work looks at the intellectual history of Goa in the early 20th century. Of course, uh, this journey was very interesting. It was an opportunity for me to look back at my collection of books. That's the only thing I'm I'm not modest about. It's it's a huge collection of two or three thousand books on Goa, and uh, you know, so and learn more things. Like this book is a uh, facsimile from the Central Library of one of the early books printed. Uh, you know, I must admit that uh, I was more interested in the library than in the classroom when I was at Goa University. And that was when I tracked down an article on FN Souza. And this is actually a note that uh, he wrote when we met, much before this, this research, of course. And uh, just three more slides. I know I'm stretching the time. But uh, you know, the learnings personally and professionally to me meant that, uh, you know, we have to look at different publishing models if we are going to get out of this uh, vicious circle of low, small markets and, uh, you know, uh, non-viability and things like that. So we are already looking at crowd uh, sourcing, crowd funding even uh, to publish books. And as some of you know, probably know, I've been into publishing myself, though that's not part of this uh, research. Uh, you know, so it it has helped my pers my work personally. Uh, it helped me to understand Goa, no doubt about that. It helped me to appreciate the struggle that many authors go through while getting published, and it uh, above all to end on a note of op optimism. I think it uh, gave me the message that the solutions might be closer than we think. You know, especially when we see the issue in context. So at the end of the day. I hope I managed to convince some young people to believe that, you know, behind all these boring, quote unquote, boring looking books, there's a whole lot of knowledge, history, background that we need to work on, we need to study. Okay, and at this point, I'll thank you for your patience. This is one of the old uh, presses that was available till a few years back at the government printing press in Canada. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Narona. Now I request uh, Professor Gupta to examine the candidate. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm keeping my camera switched off because of uh, bandwidth reasons. Uh, I hope that's okay. And I hope you can hear me um, uh, clearly. Um, yes, 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 Professor. Uh, thank Professor, you very much. Uh, Professor, uh, you're, you're welcome. To to keep the camera on. I request others to please uh, put cameras off. Okay, in, in that in that case, um, I will turn on my camera. Um, uh, let me know if there is a problem, then I can switch it off again. Um, so, um, uh, at the very outset, um, let me uh, express uh, my, my uh, gratitude to uh, uh, Frederick and to Professor Fernandes and indeed the English Department at Goa for uh, asking me to examine this wonderful um, work on uh, literary production in Goa. Uh, I've learned a great deal from it. It has been a privilege to uh, read it and uh, to think about um, a large number of very complex issues which have been raised in this uh, pioneering work. And I may also say that <laughs> I'm very tempted, I mean, to uh, talk to uh, uh, Frederick as a publisher to publisher because uh, I'm, I've also more by accident than by design, being in charge of the university publishing house, the University Press, for the last seven years. And uh, much of what he said uh, actually resonated with me 
uh, as a publisher and it's very tempting to actually sort of put aside the academics and just talk about uh, uh, publishing realities but of course we can't do that I, I have a duty to do but let me just uh, uh, you know just before I get into the uh, academic part of this discussion uh, this sort of one thing which he said towards the end which you know I really liked and which resonated with me was this idea of uh, you know making a graphic novel out of this uh, out of out of uh, a uh, publishing narrative, which is actually the wonderful idea, which is something which I think you should seriously explore if you're thinking in terms of disseminating this work in, uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a format that is more accessible and fun. I think that's, that's a great, great, great medium to do it in. Um, and anyway, so uh, let me, let me um, uh, go to um, uh, some of the questions and comments that I have. And as I said, uh, again, much of fun for me reading this has been very, very educative because uh, uh, like many others, my view of uh, whatever little I know about um, uh, printing in Goa has actually been um, uh, somewhat cliched because, and I think that uh, the candidate has also pointed that out in one or two places that one tends to, uh, much of the view from outside Goa tends to reduce printing in Goa to a kind of missionary exercise between uh, 1556 and 1600 and 7380 when it sort of stops and we are um, there is um, very little knowledge about uh, the very lively ecosystem of um, uh, a literary ecosystem in Goa in the 20th century and uh, so this was for 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 me a great eye opener uh, to look at the ways in which um, Frederick was trying to uh, connect uh, the world of contemporary, that is to say 20th century Goan literature with a uh, kind of a long durée of uh, um, the uh, earlier three centuries and this is a as I've mentioned in my report this is a very ambitious uh, task and uh, of course the I mean you know if you're strictly thinking in terms of uh, academic uh, 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 protocols this uh, one would say that this is perhaps a very large topic I mean and, and, you know uh, any any anyone would probably say that uh, within academia would say that you would have to sort of pick and choose focus on one particular aspect but it's clear that this is a uh, just more than an academic thesis, more than this is a this is a product of both love and labor, and uh, and, and from someone who has been associated with um, the world of go on letters and publishing in a way that uh, few few have. So uh, you know, so I'm I'm not really concerned about these questions of um, you know uh, whether this is book history or not, whether the protocols of you know uh, the reason I say this is you know, if you're thinking in terms of purely the discipline of book history. Then you might say that you know very often sometimes this this is trays beyond those boundaries and it talks about let's say more literary protocols or it talks about let us say the history of libraries and so on and forth. But that again, as I said, it's not a particularly important issue for me. Um, and and uh, may perhaps I'm just I'm just sort of outlining some of the more pedantic um, uh, um, uh, comments at the beginning so that we can get sort of get rid of them. Um, that that there's that, this structural kind of a uh, uh, issue here that you know that because there is so much material, there is so much, so many, so many narratives which are being told. Uh, that sometimes the structures might seem somewhat unwieldy to uh, from, from a purely academic point of view. But that is only a very very sort of minor point in my in my. So I have two or three major questions because you see, we, uh, I'm not really qualified to talk about the. Uh, more uh, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, specific issues which pertain to uh, 20th century Goan uh, world of letters because I, you know, I, I know so very little about it. But my larger questions and, and the first question I'd like to ask is um, is about money. You see, it's about your third chapter. We will talk about economics because it seems to me that um, one of one starting point of any investigation of any um, uh, uh, culture of printing is to look at the models of publishing. So, of course, we know that there are some models which are um, where the it is books are not circulated by way of trade. So, for example, the missionary model where books are primarily given away. So, there the money comes from crowdsourcing or crowdfunding from uh, um, from the from from the devout. Uh, equally, there is government printing which has its own kind of sources of funding. Now, I find that uh, when when I when I think about um, um, you know, printing um, or publishing uh, worlds of printing and publishing in various parts of um, anyway, whichever one I'm studying or looking at, this is a good place to start from. Where does the money come from? And uh, I was wondering whether um, uh, you could perhaps um, tell us about 
what are the in, in 20th century Goa, what are the major sources of book funding? I mean, where does the venture capital come from? Where does the publisher or the printer uh, get um, uh, acquire the funds in order to set up? And how does this flow of funds work, or does it not work at all? I mean, you mentioned about crowdsourcing, but I'd be interested if you could sort of expand on this a little bit. Professor, thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. And uh, you know, first of all, uh, I fully agree with with uh, the very uh, you have po pointed out very politely that I've bitten off more than I put you. So it shows that you know I uh, just managed to finish it in the last hour of the last day of the last month and things like that. But I enjoyed uh, the journey throughout, and it was uh, really something that uh, you know uh, worked well for me because I'm interested in the field and have been for my young days. Uh, the 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 second thing is as far as money goes. You said about missionaries, uh, you know, handing out material and all. Uh, I would like to differ slightly because if you look today, uh, the the missionaries and religious persons are <laughs> about the best to to have viable business models to sell their books, you know, and they are actually quite good at it. Whichever religion, even uh, of course the Christian missionaries have been doing it, and uh, also the the recent work on on the the uh, Hindi printing in, in in North India has also shown shown something similar there. But uh, you know, I often argue with them that if you want to spread your message, why are you using copy copyrighted models? It doesn't make sense. No, you could think of other options. But but no, they see it as uh, it's as important as spreading their message as it is to to make uh, make you know to cover the costs and to make ends meet. As far as uh, uh, Goa goes and the 20th century, to answer your question specifically, uh, initially at least. See, as long as the colonial government was in place, a lot depended on uh, who had the the approval to print, because we are living in a context that uh, you know 20th century actually saw censorship in 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 Goa in a very strict sense. Uh, this is the Salazar era uh, between the 1930s and and 1961. Uh, of course, it's also my argument that uh, the full of Portuguese rule has not been only Salazar and religious intolerance. There are many different aspects to it. But when Salazar was here, of course, it was very centralized and very kind of state, uh, state, uh, state driven. But uh, later on, uh, you know, for the first uh, maybe 15, 20 years, people just went to printers and directly printed. So Dr. Sandra Atai Lobo's father, who uh, George Atai Lobo, has written a book called Goa, 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 Goa the Liberation, Goa Liberation. It's a novel, and he just went to the printer and he paid the printer and got it printed. Uh, then along the way, you find a little bit of state uh, support and uh, sponsorship coming in. Before that, actually, you had Fundasa Orient, which played a crucial role, uh, you know, in actually subsidizing published publications up to the extent of say 20, 25,000. So you know, it's been my argument that uh, because of the small market, it's that small gap that needs to be kind of bridged. It's a small gap that needs to be bridged. So Fundasan Orient would give 25,000. Then probably the government learned from them. They had a scheme which was running quite well uh, till not so long back about uh, you know offering uh, authors up to a subsidy of up to 25,000 for a book, which is not much, but it helped to bridge the gap and uh, make non-viable books into viable books. And uh, in that sense, so you you had these kind of uh, models in play. If you're asking me a personal question, you know. Uh, we have at least four or five different models which try to make to make a book viable and stand on its own feet, including uh, you know institutional support from from the publishers or teaming up with a bookshop, where the bookshop buys bulk like you know two or three hundred copies, and then uh, that would cover a large part of your printing cost at least, and you know th those kind of models, uh, you know even uh, even uh, e-books which are kind of uh, supported or sponsored. And uh, you know, or, or even they stand on their own feet because the main problem with uh, with with, uh, with publishing is that you have a print run of a thousand if you want to be viable, and if your market is two hundred or three hundred copies, then there's a gap between these two. So you you mentioned uh, uh, e, e editions. So is there a sort of diasporic uh, market for e-editions, sorry, I'm just sort of digressive question because you mentioned that, um, that you know, electronic editions, uh, that which, which you produce, I mean, do you have a ready market for that or is that more uncertain? So, professor, I don't know if people are used to, have got used to the idea of paying for e-products in India as yet, you know, though Amazon gives us impressive figures and things like that, you know, what the quantity, the quality of what goes into Amazon sales, 
is another issue altogether in india whether people are willing able to pay for their for their uh, for the ebooks i am not yet sure so we would say that you know if the other day we put out a ebook which was very easy to produce and we just give it out for free or if someone is willing to part sponsor it then we could do that also so we have to find ways of knowledge getting out because it's no good excuse that you know knowledge cannot get out because it cannot pay for itself the uh, another question which is uh, related more to your perhaps methodology um, and this is a problem i think which is faced by most print historians working in india and where we sort of um, where we feel envious of print historians working in the west and that is the uh, lack of uh, uh, publishers archives uh, i mean I, i i see that you have um, relied a lot on interviews and kind of um, personal accounts uh, have you been able to find any kind of uh, publishing records um, in in uh, Of the, of the publishing houses or printers that you have looked at, that is true, Professor. Your point is absolutely valid because uh, even other friends in Europe told me that you know this is a work which needs to be done. But I must confess, I have not done enough on that. Like there is, for example, this full uh, printing house called uh, Typographia Rangel, which runs out of a village in North Goa, like you know outside Mapsa town, as I was saying, Bastora, and uh, like that has single-handedly brought out of. few hundred if not more than a thousand publications and you know but the records are so difficult to come by we uh, i it's it's partly my fault also for not focusing on that aspect but that would have you know here i was just trying to get a lay of the land and maybe that might be future work i'm sure that can be you know some other uh, in a later work or some other historian can actually because as you see you have you have taken a wide angle view of the uh, and, and you have sort of prepared a map for future explorers to go on ahead i mean so that that is that is that is work which can be done if uh, especially with the uh, publishing house the typography angle that you that you mentioned and it also and one of the things that you said about that publishing house also leads me very very nicely to my next question because you just uh, mentioned that it it's uh, about the location which is in a village outside mapusa now uh, and uh, at the heart of your thesis is this the core peri periphery idea which i find uh, very very uh, i think uh, persuasive for a number of reasons of course there are numbers of cores and peripheries so you talk about for example the relationship between or metropole that is to say the uh, of portugal and goa on the one hand and uh, currently i myself was sort of struggling to write a book on um, printing uh, outside calcutta in bengal so you know the the decent decentering of calcutta how uh, printing moves away from uh, the metropole to the provinces and uh, i'm sort of this is something which is which has been agitating me and in a sense to sort of try and find a narrative focus for or or a narrative logic for non uh, metropolitan printing so i'm wondering whether within goa there is also this kind of relationship for example in bengal calcutta sort of dominates the hinterland like perhaps no other place in india now is there a similar kind of uh, center periphery or metropole province relationship between uh, um, printing in goa in the urban centers and the rural centers or is it not that pronounced uh, what would you say to that no absolutely professor like uh, that's a fact because you know when we talk about goa which goa are we talking about it's not like you know as i was saying goa is not one uniform place where all things are equal and everyone has a, a equal access to printing and you know every place has its own presses and all that so we do have a very strong uh, divides in goa i think viswarup viswarup das uh, has done a thesis which i was lucky to see because a friend uh, passed it on to me otherwise these things are not even on uh, you know on shor ganga and things like that because it was like in the 80s and he has spoken about the 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 gap between the old conquest and the new conquest in that sense you know which is this uh, based on accidents of colonial history or uh, you know treaties that uh, that helped the portuguese to take over certain lands so the parts which were which were taken over the first uh, had a greater access to everything infrastructure and you know uh, transport and jobs and uh, you know migration and education and whatever you say so bisarup das has actually studied it so it would be less than honest on my part if i try to deny it or push it under the carpet it doesn't exist it does it does and uh, you know that's where even in the in the scope of other studies i said that we need studies at the regional level for example you know uh, since i've taken on uh, working in different languages obviously i'm going my you know my lack of knowledge is going to show somewhere so i hope that it inspires other youngsters to to you know specialize in in these issues which which ha are there and have to be raised and the, the, the other thing that you also mentioned um, i think that is a question which is sort of linked with this as well 
is the question of distribution both then and now so you know it is as you know as a publisher it is quite easy to publish but to get your get one's books to the readers is a challenge i mean so and especially with small with smaller medium publishers who do not have much distributing muscle um, the question of dissemination um, becomes uh, a major headache so again um, i mean uh, how would you see the history of i mean if there is a such a coherent history of the dispersal of print i mean you know, you know the way the or the distributing mechanisms that worked within goa so if you look if you think about 20th century publishing uh, what is the uh, ecosystem of let's say bookshops or agents or news agents or you know uh, could you perhaps uh, tell tell us a bit about that sadly it doesn't seem to have existed professor because uh, you know much of the time uh, it was just based on the authors or the you know publishers determination to get a book out so once you get a book out then you are wondering what do you do with 600 copies under your bed something like that so so you know my argument is uh, beyond the thesis of course i have not uh, touched on 21st century because uh, then you know there would be a conflict of interest with my own views and my own practice and and the, the theory but uh, what i feel personally is that we need to find alternative ways of doing it so we are trying to you know focus on promoting the book uh, the goa book like books related to goa so as of now i can very confidently say that you have 70 uh, 100 200 people who will buy any book that comes out on goa because they collect these things and they know the value of it if we can raise that number to 1000 then automatically we kind of uh, you know under uh, manage to uh, make a book viable so the thesis looks at the example of places like kerala for example where they have a library movement going back to the 1950s they have a the kind of author cooperatives which uh, which actually allow uh, you know authors to publish their books and to get huge kind of readerships and distributions and things like that together with that comes the library movement so once the ecosystem is in place you know then uh, things become much more easier but we are still not there thank you thank you uh, now i come to one question which i also mentioned in my report i mean right now that question is slightly distant from my mind but because i mentioned it in my report i am sort of uh, reiterating it is that uh, again i mean you know we have been talking about book uh, book, book publishing but you have also discussed uh, the periodical press particularly newspapers like o heraldo and others so um, so what is very were these different book printers or were the would, would the same printer do both books and newspapers and periodicals i mean what was the relationship between the two or are these very different sectors of uh, print in goa uh, yes professor actually i have kept out of uh, newspapers i have kept out of newspapers because uh, it would be a kind of a distraction in that sense and it would be out of the topic also uh, professor rekha mishra has done a phd from history uh it is quite some time back on the history of the press in goa uh i have only touched exactly as you are saying i have touched on those uh, printing presses those newspaper presses which were also into book publishing uh, or you know they were at least acting as printers for books so for example uh, you you had a lot of books published by kaza jd fernandes uh, which were which are the owners of herald oeral and things like that and along the way they also published books so in that sense you know i focused on this aspect you will find it uh, in their names like for example you know uh, they are published uh, uh, the book would be Uh, you know, we required to write two two dissertations for that, and now I have only one or two more questions, and this are slightly slightly outside the scope of your thesis, but I'm asking it out of a person out of personal curiosity, and this actually goes back to the uh, to the to the historical past, and uh, you see, um, you know, again as I said that you're, you're uh, yes, there is uh, as you all know there is the kind of little there's a gap of about a century and a half in uh, printing in Goa between the late 17th and early 19th centuries. however i wonder and you know then i'm asking this from a position of complete ignorance this is just something uh, which uh, occurred to me that along with if print was not alive was there a scribal culture which was alive and uh, do you see any i mean any relationship between um, 
manuscript or scribal cultures, if there was one such, with uh, the early rise of print. I mean, is, is that a is, is there a history or is there a connection at all between between these two phenomena? That's that's a very interesting uh, question, Professor. But uh, to be honest. I've not thought about it. I've not looked at it. So you know, in that sense, it's a it's a very fascinating question. Uh, because you know, the reason I ask is because in uh, I mean, I we, we all start out I think as print historians, but in many cases later we have begun to find that it's in in Bengal or and elsewhere there is a kind of relationship between script and print, which um, we had not thought of before. Again, I don't know. It may not be the case in Goa. So it may. Uh, so that, as I said, it's a completely speculative question. Um, uh, for, uh, for that reason, so yeah, that's that's just a, some something to uh, sort of you know um, by the by, as it were. I really do not have uh, too many other questions. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I I was also thinking of, but again, I think this is not does not entirely belong with this. You were talking about the side effects of missionary printing, right? I mean, you were talking about how um, uh, missionary printing um, uh, was not just about mission printing; it, it also generated a different kind of. Uh, uh, side effects um, uh, in the sort of um, immediate context of its printing. Um, I mean, could you uh, could you perhaps elaborate a bit more on that, uh, on on what you might designate as these um, ancillary effects of uh, printing in the 16th or 17th centuries? Uh, yes, Professor. One is, of course, the 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 growth. You know, the language contribution of the language in that sense. You know, contribution to the languages. So, uh, it, uh, as I mentioned, the Portuguese and not only the Portuguese, but also the foreign Padroado linked uh, missionaries have in one way or, or the other described, uh, you know, languages like Tamil, Malabar, Marathi, Bengali, Konkani, uh, which they call Kanari and things like that, Hindustani, uh, Malay, Japanese, Chinese, Americ and Sinhalese, you know, so they've uh, they've been focusing on uh, these languages, of course, for their own goals. But uh, you know, as I say, it's a law of unintended consequences, so it doesn't really matter, you know, what the intentions were. The second kind of uh, consequence that uh, came about was the kind of huge knowledge infrastructure, uh, knowledge uh, exchange that uh, this press, this tiny small press, had. Uh, in, in, in the rest of the world, for example. So works which were written by, say, João de Barros gets translated into Dutch. Uh, Manuel de Faria y Souza's work gets translated into English, uh, you know, like uh, under the title of the Portuguese in Asia. And uh, João Mendes Pinto's work also gets uh, translated and things like that. Uh, there is a, a section on my in my book where I talk about how the work of Linchoten, for example, you know, uh, gets uh, translated into Dutch and actually plays a role in in, uh, in influencing the attitudes of the Dutch and the impact that they have in Asian colonial history. You know, so Lin Shoten was this uh, person who was the secretary to the Archbishop of Goa and later on it was discovered that he was a Dutch spy. So, you know, he, he actually uh, has doctor had access to the maps and to a whole lot of other things which he made use of. So uh, apart from these two things, no, uh, there is also the the information about plants and medicines uh, going back at an early stage of European colonialism, when Europe was also trying to learn from Asia. So you find this full book by Garcia de Orta. Yes, yes, of course. The Panja Municipal Garden is still named today. It was recently renamed actually after him, so I thought it was interesting. And his book gets uh, copied and rewritten into Dutch, uh, you know, and uh, gets studied and it's made use of uh, by a whole lot of scholars there. So, so there are lists of how this kind of knowledge uh, influences the global understanding, not just of Goa, not just of India, but of Asia as a whole, you know, and, and actually shapes up colonial history. That's, that's, that's the argument. So, Carolinus Cassius, uh, you know, reformulated Garcia de Orta's work. And there's a debate till today whether it was a reformulation, a copying, a kind of a plagiarism or whatever. But, you know, I guess that they saw it very differently from the way we see all these issues today, you know. And, you know, because you were talking about translations, uh, I, I was also wondering how, how important is, uh, has translation played as a genre role uh, as a genre in modern publishing? Uh, I mean, is there a lively culture of translation across the multiple languages that are spoken in the region? You know, actually, uh, it is happening, and there are initiatives by uh, people like uh, you know Dogger's uh, Bookshop and uh, 
uh, Leonard and Queenie, who are my friendly rivals in the field, but who have done good job in terms of translations. But uh, it's uh, you know so far we have uh, we are a multilingual society, and I think the fact that uh, the fact of the matter is that Goa is not accepted as a multilingual society. We kind of try to pretend we are monolingual and things like that. So the translations have not happened sufficiently, and uh, there is need. Even I, I I would push if I had the chance to make use of this forum. Even Goa University, with all the language skills it has, you know French, Portuguese. uh hindi sanskrit uh, marathi could also take the lead and you know have these kind of networks but not enough has happened uh um, thank you thank you frederick i think um, and uh, i i don't have any more questions it is that was very uh, i know i i really enjoyed listening to you and you know having this discussion um uh, i i don't know what the rules of the viva was here are the are questions open um, and how yeah, yeah. So, yes professor it's uh, it's open for uh, discussion so uh, if uh, the members of uh, the audience have any questions you are uh, you are free to ask now and uh, yeah so professor it's it's up to you whether whether you know to admit those questions or not you are the sole adjudicator okay i i see I think uh, I mean if, if uh, Frederick doesn't mind, maybe ten or fifteen minutes of questions, but maybe till about um, I think would uh, I would I I would be happy to um, you know. I mean, yeah. There are so many people who are listening to. I've never seen so so many people attend a PhD by in my <laughs> in my experience. And I do I also have to formally say that the PhD the viva is passed and the PhD. Yes. 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 That is, yes, that so, is later. 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 Okay. 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 I see. I see. Yeah. yeah. So maybe uh, uh, since there are so many of uh, you listening, maybe the. Uh, we could have uh, a few questions um, uh, questions not comments <laughs> so uh, perhaps uh, uh, i mean please, please do go ahead and ask if uh, any one of the members so there are some comments maybe okay well it appears that uh, you know uh, uh, may i say uh, yes yes of may course I? of course of course uh, angelicho yes please yeah yeah uh, frederick only you could have done a thesis like this in goa uh, congratulations uh, i i'm curious about what uh, the printing scenario was back in 1556 were we catering to certain kind of audience in the, in, in terms like you know only the local or gradually we evolved to uh, publishing as you said that we were the home uh, in the asia like publishing whole hub in asia so are we were we catering also to uh, the other countries and other uh, other states within uh, sorry within the country itself like i'm curious to just you know i it may be a little outside the scope of your uh, uh, research but just to uh, no no so just no, professor yeah. throw some light here Yeah, it's very much in the scope. Uh, you know, uh, I can define what it was not, what it was not, rather than defining what it was. So, for example, the fact of the matter is that it was not a democratic press. Okay, it was a colonial press, and uh, Gutenberg in Europe is very different from uh, when Gutenberg reaches reaches uh, you know Asian shores because the role and the purpose and all is very different. Uh, it was it was a Portuguese press in that sense. Uh, there was an increasing interest in uh, in local languages but they had problems with fonts they had problems with fonts they tried but they didn't manage so so like they tried printing tamil in the roman script and things like that and the first book in tamil actually gets published in uh, in, in in europe not in india because they were struggling with the fonts uh, in terms of access to who could access it and all that that was an issue Uh, so my argument is that the law of unintended consequences takes hold, and despite uh, whatever was intended, they actually, uh, you know, it it did have a lot of uh, consequences which we need to understand and which we have not understood. So it it is very different. It is very different from Gutenberg in Europe. It is very different from Frankibar, uh, from Serampur. Uh, you know, because of course. uh sometimes sometimes serampore and tanki bar and all are shown as the more liberal face of the press and the portuguese are shown as the more more kind of uh, bigoted the face of the press that that i don't accept quite easily because uh, you know 100 150 200 years have separated these two 
uh, also you know the, the the press came here by accident so that we have to concede and it was supposed to go by to ethiopia as you all know abyssinia the the story is there but i also argue in my uh, thesis that while it came here by accident it didn't stay on by accident because uh, the portuguese had already decided that you know goa would be an important uh, place for their for their uh, for as a as a kind of uh, you know kind of staging post in in asia so it stayed on here with a purpose i hope i answered Uh, can I intervene? Hello, I'm Sandra. Doctor Tell. Hello. I am listening. Yes, yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, congratulations, first of all, Frederick, for this uh, uh, wonderful uh, seasons and uh, for your uh, presentation and uh, uh, also congratulations, uh, Professor Gupta, for such a, an interesting uh, discussion. Um, I would, uh, I would like to, because I had the privilege of reading your thesis uh, uh, on a, a, a lead stage, uh, one of the things you mentioned in, uh, is this uh, um, um, doubt about the actual impact in Goa of all these immense uh, uh, publishing activity that we uh, we can exist uh, uh, between nineteenth uh, and twentieth century, especially uh, not only in Goa but outside uh, uh, Goa. Um, and this relates also with um, Professor Gupta's. Uh, question uh, about uh, this relation between newspapers and uh, uh, yeah, periodical yeah, yeah. printing and uh, book publishing. Um, wouldn't, what could, uh, wouldn't it be interesting uh, to actually relate this uh, two walls of book publishing and press by um, studying the impact of book publishing in press and how books uh, uh, and print were, was discussed in uh, in press uh, it may be uh, key to try to understand impact of all this movement both inside and outside Delaware it's more I would like you to to hear your opinion about it. Doctor, uh, you know, if, if there are any shortcomings, it is purely my fault. So it's not that these things don't exist, so I don't see it as a possibility, but maybe because of the shortage of time, I couldn't, uh, you know, work on uh, these related areas. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of ashamed to admit <laughs> that today some of the interesting research that is happening is on Goa is happening outside Goa, uh, you know, uh, in places like Portugal, Brazil, and you all guys have a, a advantage when it comes to the language, though we may have some locational advantage by being here, but uh, I don't think we are leveraging that enough. So, uh, you know, all these fields need to be worked on. Uh, at the most, you know, I mean, uh, I was a bit uh, bogged down with the 101 things I tend to get involved in at the same time, so that is a shortcoming, no doubt. But I hope that I've managed to inspire and uh, kind of suggest to others or place this on the agenda that, you know, there, there are so many things. And at the end of the day, I think scholars need to work more in collaboration with each other because the kind of work that you all are doing in, 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 uh, in Europe is, is fascinating to us. And very often we cannot even read it. You know, now Google Translate and things like that are making accessible. But I hope that we can have more collaboration between, you know, professors there and students here, professors here and students there, whatever. Thank you. Yes, I think that collaboration, it's uh, key uh, 
uh, on all this issue and it, it's it's important uh, there's been uh, important work being done outside Goa but also there's been important work done inside Goa which many times doesn't reach a, a, a larger academic audience and it's a shame um, so this collaboration needs to to be, uh, to be developed and what uh, ways of doing it and perhaps this new technologies that are uh, available can be key because uh, in many cases we are speaking in uh, uh, difficulties also in traveling costs and all, 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 all that so we we may overcome some of these issues uh, using the new technologies and also one thing I think it's very important if I may intervene it's uh, uh, even in our collaboration with between departments, linguistic departments, and history department, the history department, because it's it's a way of addressing the problems of trans. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I will. I will speak to you a little later. Okay. No, yes, sir. If I remember right, uh, you know, all the way from there, and paper was an issue then also. Though, of course, uh, just because they are not discussing it, we cannot presume that uh, it wasn't a Only problem. As recent as the 20th century, as you were talking about newsprint, we all remember what the 1980s and uh, 70s were. So there were. Uh, you know, newspapers who ran newspapers and the, the 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 kind of behind the scenes story was that they ran newspapers so that they could get newsprint allocation and probably, mm. you know, divert it to right. whatever in that sense. So these are very interesting. Mm. Uh, I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, though. It was fascinating. And I and I hope you follow it up with more work, too. Thank you, Doctor. With, with the e-social sciences and... Uh, you know, uh, the support that you have given us even from the EPW and all in the past, I'm really grateful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to answer Dr. Rafael's question, should the author approach a publisher or, or can he do it on his own? I guess that's a very big debate. You know, it depends who you approach and uh, which uh, your, your answer that you get would depend on uh, you know, the kind of uh, approach that a person takes. Although I've been in publishing myself, I don't think there's anything sacrosanct with the publishing process. I think uh, to make a very outrageous statement, I think publishing has uh, extended its best by date. And we need to look at new models. You know, the old times where we needed to, uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, 
you had a press and 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 you needed the capital investment and all that today you find print on demand you find so many options to actually come out with your own with your own works and your own own books so the challenge in front of us is uh, how do we create the options how do we somehow get knowledge out and knowledge doesn't have to get stuck because of you know technical economic financial issues uh yeah the 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 the, the thesis also raises some of these uh, debates and so that there is no fixed answer to that i guess uh, as far as uh, translations go i also wanted to make a point that you know the lack of translations can actually hamper a, a, a book from being distributed or, or even noticed pundalik naik sakke was published in uh, 1970s but only when ache was uh, translated into english around 2002 2003 through the through the good offices of dr maria arora that uh, the book got widely noticed But there, uh, yes, and there's a, a vast camp in this uh, field also to understand I, uh, the circulation of ideas. So, how, how did ideas circulate and were uh, retaught and enriched in this moving between uh, uh, languages, which uh, Yeah. which is a vast gap that to be explored i i believe yeah i i don't think i've done enough justice to explaining that aspect of the thesis because that was one of the most fascinating things that uh, you know i came across that uh, books and publishing was actually making the world a different place so if europe was getting access to some kind of medicines it was based on the knowledge of the medicinal plants that the vaidyas you know traditional healers who are still into the field in in goa and others knew about uh, about all these kind of things so not only in goa but then hortus malabaricus the book published in kerala as three persons who are linked to goa in terms of you know they are from the saraswat clan which is uh, also uh, goa based and things like that so they are the translators of hortus malabaricus which goes into into the dutch uh, discourse then then at the on the other hand the translation of languages you know uh, even even someone like uh, sebastian delgado who has written his uh, dictionary of uh, portuguese vocables in asiatic languages as it's, it's called in translation it's still available online for free at archive.org so he studied like you know 30 40 different languages and shows you which portuguese words have ended up where so you know these kind of uh, connects are forgotten today or they are politically inconvenient to talk about because in our nationalist discourse we kind of uh, you know uh, see this as as not the uh, not not uh, fitting into the to the wider kind of political context but on the other hand you see uh, uh, there were studies of goa which are completely forgotten about and which need to be revived for example this uh, Figueroa was a Spanish uh, official who was sent uh, to Goa during the time when Spain ruled over Portugal, and he has written a book called uh, called something in Portuguese. Sorry, I don't know the name now offhand. But uh, when when you know when uh, the late Dr. Paulo Varela Gomes was alive, he had an intention of having it translated and published. And he says that this Spanish work is more interesting is a more interesting perception of old Goa than any other Portuguese work. for example and uh, we were trying to get it translated it was a costly job you know from one european language into english is very costly in india it's it's much more affordable from indian languages but uh, finally unfortunately dr varela gomes passed away and it never got done so you know all these uh, these kind of realities are there the trans transfer of knowledge has shaped the world in in a huge way which is not visible to us immediately but uh, i hope that as we look deeper we'll find more and more things and the mode uh, you know every day i spend on it something new comes up so it's never really complete many thanks thank you uh rico i was trying to <clears throat> ask about the transitions that are that are affecting pilar used to publish books 
but now they they themselves are forced to print uh, the newspaper of Arden through East or call magazine elsewhere. Uh, New Age, of course, has uh, has taken up publishing, but I think they are affected by the changes in uh, tech as well as labor laws. Uh, in fact, Arden through East was forced to go elsewhere when um, uh, the commission and uh, was it the newspaper commission. Uh, said uh, or regulated uh, payments for labor and they found that it was no more affordable. Uh, tech is affecting in a very big way. So uh, your thesis was more to do with the 20th century. How do you look at it now in the 21st century, the challenges that uh, uh, books are likely to face? But I think you could throw light on that. Uh, yes, Professor, actually uh, new challenges are coming up all the time. I get your point on labor laws because uh, you know, newspaper salaries are are, are uh, controlled by the government in that sense. So, if you are a small paper, it becomes very difficult to sustain it because you have to pay at government uh, decided rates. Uh, but having said that, you know, I suffer from optimism sometimes. I feel so. I think there are new options also coming up all the time. Now, whether whether a small state can plug into these possibilities fast enough, quick enough, that's the challenge because big cities seem to be doing it very well. You know, Indian publishing today, at least uh, for a long time, has been on the upswing and has been a success story, apart from the setbacks of, you know, the economy and, and pandemic and things like that. But, uh, you know, big cities seem to be well plugged into this new technology thing. Uh, I don't know how fast or how far, you know, the smaller places can go into it. But we need to look and we need to, you know, to be optimistic. As, as uh, one of the scholars I've quoted in my book was saying, uh, you know, academia and book publishing have a very close relationship in the sense that, you know, all, all scholarly work has to get published sooner or later. But uh, unfortunately, it's only seen as a relationship that is more functional. Like, so, you know, my book needs to be published, so therefore I approach a publisher. But uh, on the other hand, you know, we need to also look at it as a field for further research. That, you know, Professor, Professor Gupta's coming here will inspire someone at the university to also take up to book history in a big way, you know, the younger people in particular. We have a couple more questions in the, um, in the, in the chat boxes. Maybe those are the last two we could take, uh, if, because we're running out of time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Anupam has raised the issue of uh, digitizing the book and selling it to Amazon. Uh, you know, I don't want to go there because uh, from from my experience in the field, it's a tough kind of field, you know, and uh, there are all kinds of restrictions on which books sell and what kind of uh, material you need to write. Uh, how many people would notice your book? In theory, it seems fine that anyone can put a book out there, but try it and see. It's very difficult to to get a market. But having said that, the solution could be and should be should be somewhere. You know, we need to look hard enough. You never know. Uh, Denzel wants me to know wants me to mention if you could touch upon. What do you think of some of the important lessons we can learn from the history of publishing in Goa? Good question. And what aspects of the past were then really going to return? Okay, uh, so in terms of the lessons we can learn, going beyond the thesis, what I've said in the thesis, I think that uh, publishing is an international game and national game, and we need to be connected with uh, players all over the place. If we are going, if small places like Goa are to, you know, to even to get noticed, forget about making its presence felt. Uh, Goa could play a role as, as uh, you know, uh, in colonial times because of the technology it got from Portugal, because of the, uh, you know, the printers that it got, and and uh, also the kind of uh, organizational skills that it had. Uh, being part of the pan-Indian reality is also helping uh, Goa to to get into new forms of publishing. So much of our publishing today depends on printers outside Goa. So you know it's still more viable and more uh, you know technically uh, feasible to print a book outside Goa than just to print in Goa. 
so how do you know how do we position ourselves my argument has long been that india has a big role to play in publishing worldwide and uh, you know if singapore and small countries like that can do it then definitely we could play the stand our historic role and probably reclaim a little bit of that it would be great thank you very much um uh, frederick and thank you everyone for the questions um so uh, i think we have come to the end of the question and answer session and uh, what what needs to be done now sir professor yeah yeah professor you can now go ahead and uh, make the announcement so it gives me great pleasure <laughs> and uh, to to uh, formally state that uh, frederick noron here has uh, fulfilled all the um conditions or the criteria for the successful uh, award of a uh, doctor of philosophy in uh, in from goa in the department of english goa university and i hereby recommend the same wholeheartedly yeah uh, thank you thank you professor thank you very much so congratulations to patients Doc, dr noronia <laughs> yeah dr noronia thank thank you thank you professors i'm really grateful to uh, my guide the department my guy who's returning uh, retiring in a very few days time we will really miss him uh because i've known him for a generation and more and uh, the entire department which has been so kind to me uh the external examiners starting with uh, dr gupta who is the foremost uh, you know kind of uh, specialist of uh, print print history of india in the country today and uh, i could only uh, you know uh, be happy to have him as my guide because for me it's a academic issue of getting this doctorate but i'm grateful for the kindness with which they treated the the the, the thesis because as i go through it i find that i need to read out a whole lot of typos and things like that I'm, i i i only think that i managed to to kind of uh, a little bit you know overawe them with the facts that i brought in there but when i look at the book with my editor's hat on i say no this is not work it needs to be polished up a bit more so i'm really grateful for the kindness with which all the external examiners have treated me and of course dr rafael who is so kind of person that his voice never goes beyond i think 40 decibels or whatever it is so i'm really grateful to all of you all thank you for coming and thank you for making my day today so and i also thank uh, all the participants here for your uh, uh, active participation thank you bye Yo, goodbye. Uh, thank you, Professor Abhijit Gupta.